Having found himself reincarnated into the My Hero world, our main protagonist will try to live up to his namesake. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's your boy, Omni-sensei. Welcome to What If I Was Reborn as Iron Man in MHA, Part 6. Hit that thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. Also, remember to check out the original story linked in the description. Without further ado, let's get into it. Third person's POV. The hero killer is currently in the hospital with multiple injuries, including broken bones, fractured ribs, internal bleeding, and that's just to name a few. The Hosu chief of police began. Goddamn, Midoriya, I didn't know you had it in you to cause so much damage to one person. Tony said, looking at Midoriya in shock. Midoriya, blushing deeply and noticing everyone staring at him, covered his face. Stain was tenacious. No matter how many times I hit him, he just wouldn't go down. Even when I tried to stop him and make him focus on me, he kept going after Ida. Midoriya said quickly, trying to explain the situation. At the dawn of this extraordinary era, the police moved to prioritize leadership and maintain the status quo. Deciding not to use quirks as weapons, the chief continued. The profession of hero rose to fill that void. Woof, authorizing the use of such power, power that could so easily kill, was initially a heavily criticized decision. But it gained public support because your predecessors acted morally and complied with the law, woof. Those without permission, who inflict harm without explicit orders from the police or authorities, even if they face someone like the hero killer or the gnomus, represent a stunning breach of the law. Yeah, except I don't have a quirk, so that law doesn't really apply to me now, does it? Tony said with a shrug. The chief nodded, his dog-like ears twitching slightly. You're right, but you did breach another law, the act of vigilantism, doing the work of a hero without a hero license. Tony scratched his chin thoughtfully and raised a finger, then grabbed his phone while still holding the finger up. Walking out of the room, he kept his finger visible through the door's window. After a minute, Tony re-entered. Already taken care of, I was still in the middle of my internship with Star and Stripes at the time, so I was just following her orders. I didn't act on my own, and it's all within the law, he said, puffing out his chest proudly. And if that doesn't work, I'm politically powerful enough that the law doesn't apply to me. Not to mention, the public sees me as a hero, not a vigilante. Plus, I own property and businesses in Hosu, so I have the legal right to defend my assets from intruders, Tony flashed a peace sign, tongue sticking out slightly. No matter how you spin this, I'm in the clear. Everyone stared at him in silence, while Tony basked in the attention. Anyway, from what I gather, you're not really here to arrest us. You just wanted to explain the situation to them, right? Well, you're welcome. I know I'm awesome. Goodbye and happy holidays, Tony said, exiting the room with two peace signs this time. After a moment of heavy silence, Gran Torino muttered, Well, that brat sure is charming. Was Tony right? Is he politically immune to the law? Ida asked, genuinely curious. The chief nodded. He's right. He supplies most of the police's equipment. Arresting him would hurt us more than it would help. Honestly, I just wanted to scare him a bit. But it didn't go as planned. Tony stepped out of the hospital and into his limousine. Friday, donate a large sum to Hosu's reconstruction efforts. Make sure Eurarica's parents' construction company is heavily involved. That should keep me extra safe from public scrutiny. As you wish, boss. Shall I drive us home? Friday responded. No, hold on. Call Principal Nizu, Tony ordered, picking up a tablet to review the Mark 42 suit files. After a few rings, Principal Nizu's voice came through the speakers. Hello. Yo, if it isn't my favorite little mouse, Stark, Nizu squeaked. The one and only, is something wrong? I thought you'd be resting after the Hosu incident. I need to speak to you. It's important. Where can I meet you? Can it wait until tomorrow? I'm calling now, aren't I? 
I'm home. But, perfect. I'll see you in a few, Tony said, motioning for Friday to end the call. Meanwhile, Nizu, dressed in a small bathrobe, looked at his phone in confusion. I didn't even tell him where I live, he muttered, or that he could come over. Friday to my favorite little mouse. Let's go, Tony commanded, still engrossed in his tablet. Minutes later, they arrived at a large mansion. Tony raised an eyebrow. Overcompensating much, he muttered, staring at Nizu's grand estate. As the gates opened, Friday drove inside. Tony stepped out of the car and approached the large door. A smaller door opened, and Nizu appeared. Sighing, Nizu said, I'm literally off working hours. This better be important. Tony waved the tablet. I know where the villains that attacked Yue are hiding. They're also behind the attack on Hosu City. Nizu's expression turned serious. Come inside, he said, pushing the larger door open for Tony to follow him inside. As Tony entered, he looked around and whistled. Grand place you have here. It's just a little something to treat myself, Nizu said humbly. Tony rolled his eyes as Nizu led him toward the living room area. Nizu jumped up onto one of the couches, while Tony sat on the one opposite him. Are you ready for the greatest plot twist in UA history? Tony asked with a smirk. Nizu tilted his head in confusion. I thought you were here to tell me their locations? I am, but there's more to it. You see, I managed to get both of their blood samples, Tony said with a large grin. Nizu's eyes widened. Then I take it by your excitement their history must be very important. Oh boy, isn't it? Tony said as he tapped on the tablet a few times. Let's start with Kirojiri. He was the villain. Able to warp everyone around with his mist, Nizu nodded, remembering what was reported to him about the villains at the USJ. You see, he was once a UA student. What? Nizu squeaked in shock. Explain everything. Now, I don't remember any of my students having a quirk like what was described. Tony flipped the tablet around and showed him an image of a boy wearing a UA uniform with light blue hair that appeared soft, like a cloud, and a bandage over his nose. Next to the boy were two people Nizu knew personally, as they are members of his staff, Aizawa and present Mike, back when they were younger. Kirojiri's DNA matches the boy in the middle, Oboro Shirakumo. But that's impossible. He's dead. Nizu muttered in disbelief as his mind rapidly came to a conclusion. Anomu. Tony wasn't surprised Nizu caught on fast and nodded in confirmation. Nizu bawled his paws as his face contorted in anger. The body of one of my students was desecrated and practically turned into the undead. That is unforgivable. Tony was a bit surprised and taken aback by Nizu's anger. Looks like he cares more about his students than he lets on. I expected him to take this seriously, but not to get this angry. Third person's POV. So, what else have you found out about these villains? Nizu asked, controlling his emotions and focusing on what mattered. Well, next we have Tamura Shigaraki, real name Tenko Shimura. This one was a little harder to uncover. I had to have Friday dig through old hospital files and the like to get what I was looking for, Tony said before continuing to explain what he had found. Want to know an interesting fact? His father was named Kotaro Shimura, and his mother was Nana Shimura. Where have I heard that name before? Nizu muttered, a pensive look on his face. She was the previous wielder of one for all All Might's teacher. Hearing this, Nizu went unnaturally silent, his mind racing. Tenko Shimura, Nana Shimura, Tamura Shigaraki, All Might's master, the Nomis, all for one, Nizu muttered as he pieced together everything he had learned. I see. I think you might have just uncovered the biggest conspiracy that's been happening right under our noses. Tony nodded. All for One is planning to kill All Might using Tamura, most likely to distract him with the revelation that his previous master's grandson is now a major villain. But there's probably more to it. A villain like All for One doesn't just have one plan. He likely has backup plans for his backup plans. Okay, now that you've given me this information, what do you have in mind? Why did you call me specifically? Nizu asked, 
though he already had a faint idea of what Tony intended. I need you to use your connections to gather heroes, get them together and take these villains down, arrest them or whatever you have in mind. But first, you'll need to inform All Might of Tamura's true lineage, so he won't be caught off guard. Let him process the information safely. Nizu rested his paw on his chin. It will take time to gather the forces necessary to apprehend them. Not to mention that spatial cork of Kirajiri's will be a challenge to get past. But I'll start making some calls. We'll have a meeting about this tomorrow. Aizawa and Present Mike were really good friends with Oboro Shirakumo. They'll need to be informed and given time to digest what happened to their friend. Everything should be ready by tomorrow afternoon. But before that, where are they hiding out? Tony tapped the table a few times, and a holographic projection of Japan appeared. It zoomed in until a red dot showed the location of a bar. A few hours earlier, as Endeavor's agency kept an eye on Tamura, he was slowly regaining consciousness. He blinked in confusion before looking down at his hands. He scoffed, like some handcuffs could hold me. Tamura moved his hands with some difficulty and smirked arrogantly as his fingers touched the cuffs. However, his confident smile began to fade as he realized nothing was happening. Confused, he shifted slightly and touched the cuffs again, but still nothing. My quirk! What the hell did you bastards do to my quirk? The look of insanity and hate in Tamura's eyes sent shivers down the spines of the heroes. Suddenly, a warp portal began to open behind Tamura, and two hands appeared, pulling him back. As Endeavor's sidekicks realized what was happening, they attacked the warp portal, but it was too late. It had already closed. When Tamura reappeared in the bar, he felt something hot around his legs and saw that his pants had caught on fire from the attack. Tamura quickly tore off his pants and stomped on them repeatedly to extinguish the flames. Once the fire was out, he stood there, breathing heavily in his boxers. This humiliation. I'll kill those heroes. Tamura growled through gritted teeth. Kirojiri, get these things off me already. Tamura yelled, looking for Kirojiri. He glanced around but didn't see him until he looked down and found Kirojiri face down on the ground, unresponsive. Cautiously, Tamura walked over and nudged him with his foot. Hey, Kirojiri, you okay? Seeing no response, Tamura turned to the monitor by the table. Master, I think someone broke Kirojiri. He's injured. He's been drifting in and out of consciousness. He used the last bit of his focus to extract you from your predicament, all for one said from the other side of the monitor. He's going to be all right, right? Tamura asked growing concerned as he noticed blood staining the bar floor. Yes, although his wounds are serious, they aren't life-threatening. A trip to the doctor should have him back on his feet in a few hours. Then what am I supposed to do about these? Tamura asked, lifting his arms to show the cork nullification handcuffs around his wrists. Can't you use your corks on them? Geez, master, why didn't I think of that? Yes, I tried that already. Whatever these things are, it's like they're blocking my access to my quirk. I can't feel it. It's like it's gone. Like I don't have a quirk. And who put those on you? Do you know what happened to Kirojiri? He wouldn't talk. I think his jaw is broken, AFO asked. It was Tony Stark, Tamura said with hate. I know why Teo really hates him now. He snuck up on us and took Kirojiri out before focusing his attention on me. Tamura then went on to explain what occurred when Tony attacked them and how they were defeated. I see, AFO muttered with a hand under his chin. This Tony Stark is becoming more of a hassle than we previously expected. We'll have to do something about him. We already promised Teo that he would be the one to take him out. Tamura grumbled in annoyance. They then heard a groaning sound and saw Kirojiri slowly standing up. You're finally up. Get these stupid cuffs off me. Kirojiri slowly lifted his hand and extended his mist toward Tamura's hands. However, as Kirojiri's mist almost made contact with the cuffs, they released a small, undetectable wave of energy that nullified the power of the mist. The same energy that was keeping Tamura from accessing his quirk. Why isn't it working? Kirojiri slowly shrugged his shoulders, as he didn't know what was happening either. Why aren't you talking? Kirojiri motioned toward his jaw and made a snapping motion with his hands. I see. 
So he really did break your jaw? Tamura asked as he played along with their game of charades. Kirojiri nodded his head in confirmation. Kirojiri, go to the doctor in a few minutes. He should be able to quickly fix you up. As you go, I'll send Forger to try and get Tamura out of the cuffs, AFO ordered. Tony was at the door of Nizu's estate, already leaving. Was that all you wanted to share with me? Nizu asked curiously. Tony nodded. Yeah, that was all. If I find out anything else, I'll be sure to inform you. Please do, Nizu said before closing the door as Tony walked back to his ride. Shall I take you home, boss? Friday asked from inside the limo. Yes, and take your time. No need to rush, Tony said as he resumed studying Mark 42. As Tony was being escorted home, he began to draw on the table. A silver and blue ring. In the middle of that ring was the shape of the arc reactor. Third person's POV. Tony was deep in thought, rubbing his chin as he muttered, Emotions are a form of power in themselves. So if I can harness them, I could use that energy to fuel my constructs. I'll have the ring read my electroneural pathways and focus on my strongest emotions as the base. Then, I could convert emotional energy into light, just like the energy conversion theory but on a more personal scale. Swiping away his notes, Tony began scribbling an intricate equation in the tablet with his fingers, lost in his mental calculations. After a while, Friday's voice cut in, We've arrived, boss. Tony barely looked up, responding with a distracted, Uh-huh. Say, Friday, Tony asked absent-mindedly, If you had to name my strongest emotion, what would it be? Pettiness. Friday replied without a moment's hesitation. Tony paused and looked up with a straight face. I was being serious. So was I, Friday quipped. Boss, you are by far the pettiest person I know. Tony sighed, regretting the sense of humor he'd programmed into her. Okay, what positive emotion would you say is my strongest? Do you have any? Friday replied cheekily. Friday, don't blame me. Blame your programming. You added comedic timing into it. All right, no funny business. I want your honest answer. But boss, I'm an AI. I don't have opinions, just calculated responses. Opinions are for humans. Tony raised an eyebrow. All right, based on your calculations, what would you say is my strongest emotion? Calculating, Friday responded, taking a moment before answering. Your strongest emotion is resolve. After the death of Edwin Jarvis, you resolved yourself to honor his memory by becoming a hero. That unwavering resolve has been the core of every decision you've made. Pushing the limits of your inventions and constantly evolving, Tony let out a deep sigh, leaning back in his chair. Too bad being smart isn't an emotion, he muttered as he exited the car. Thanks, Friday. As Tony made his way to the lab, still furiously writing in the tablet, he heard an explosion nearby but chose to ignore it. His focus was too sharp to be shaken. Come on, May. We talked about this. Melissa's voice rang out in frustration. Hee <laughs> hee. But explosions are fun, aren't they? Things always work perfectly after they explode. May replied enthusiastically. That's a terrible way to do things. Think of all the resources you're wasting. Oh, hi, Tony. Melissa greeted as she spotted him. Aha! Uh -huh. Hello! Tony mumbled, barely paying attention. May peeked out from behind a cloud of smoke, grinning ear to ear. Hiya! Boss man! Hiya! Tony responded absent-mindedly, his eyes fixed on the equations he was writing. May turned to Melissa with a confused look. Melissa sighed. He's in his creative stage again. He blocks out everything when he's like this. So, no lesson today? May asked, a bit disappointed. Are you saying I'm not good enough? Melissa teased, raising an eyebrow. May patted her on the shoulder. You're no Tony Stark, but you'll do for now. She chirped before happily skipping off. Melissa's mouth dropped open in mock outrage. Now that's just mean. I'm teaching you out of the kindness of my heart. Never said I didn't appreciate it. Come on, creative sister. Let's make some babies. May yelled excitedly as she returned to work. As the night wore on,
Friday chimed in again. You have an incoming call from Spawn Point. Answer, Tony commanded. Tony, came Maria's voice. Hello, mother. How do you do? Tony replied, briefly pulling his attention away from his work. Maria let out a sigh of relief. I was worried about you. You didn't come for lunch, and then I heard about what happened in Hosu. I just wanted to make sure you're okay. I didn't sustain a single injury, fortunately. Just shows how effective my suits are, Tony said, the pride in his voice unmistakable. That's good. Will you be coming over tomorrow? Tony hesitated, his fingers hovering over the holographic keys. I have some plans I need to oversee. Oh, the disappointment in Maria's voice was clear. Tony closed his eyes and sighed. But I'll make sure to come over tomorrow, even if it's late. How does that sound? Hee <laughs> hee, that sounds lovely. All right, good night. Love you. Love you too. Tony blushed slightly as Maria ended the call. He shook his head. Why is that always so embarrassing? He thought before diving back into work. It wasn't long before midnight rolled around and May finally left the lab. Melissa appeared shortly after, wrapping her arms around Tony and kissing his cheek. Are you staying here all night? She asked softly. Unfortunately, yes. Tony sighed as the code and equations flowed across the screen, his fingers dancing over the holographic interface. He leaned back into Melissa's embrace, taking a brief moment to enjoy the comfort before diving back into his relentless work. Tony kissed her cheek without looking away from the screen. Sorry that I won't be joining you today. Melissa shook her head. It's okay. I know how busy you are. Tony and Melissa shared one final kiss before Melissa retired to her room. Friday. Get the 3D printer to start working on the design I just highlighted. Sure thing, boss. Friday replied as she followed the instructions. Tony continued typing as he muttered, stronger emotional output equals a stronger, sturdier response from light. And there, Tony began stretching and cracking his fingers. Ugg, talk about overworking. I don't think I've had a good sleep in a while. Tony stood up, swinging his arms as he stretched and cracked his back, which was stiff from sitting too long. Tony walked over to the 3D printer and saw that a single mole of a ring was being made. Multiple parts of the printer were moving and building what looked like circuitry lines on the inside of the ring. After a while, the machines retracted, leaving a silver and blue ring. It is done, boss. You can now go and collect it. Tony nodded as he entered the room and took the ring off what appeared to be a pedestal. He weighed it in his hands, flipping it in the air and catching it once more. How did it come out, Friday? It was a success. The combination of vibranium and adamantium, with the help of other alloys, created what you would call proto-adamantium. Kasha. Tony celebrated, pumping his fist. Now then, Tony walked towards another part of his lab, grabbed a Stark reactor, and began looking around for a blue disc. Friday. Did you make the shrinking disc like I said earlier today? Yes, boss. There in the drawer, third cabinet, Friday responded. Tony opened the cabinet and found two glass cases, one with blue discs and another with red. He opened the blue case and took one out. He closed the cabinet, hit the middle part of the blue disc, and threw it at the Stark reactor, causing it to shrink to an even smaller size. Tony smirked. Even though it's smaller, it should have the same amount of power, he thought as he grabbed tweezers. Tony picked up the tiny Stark reactor, concentrated with his tongue to the side, and placed it on the empty large part of the ring. As he released it, the ring emitted a pulse of energy. Blue circuitry lines glowed with life as it activated. The casing closed over the power core, and the front casing of the ring displayed a glowing image of an arc reactor, which was larger than the core he inserted. From the back of the ring, a needle appeared, which Tony pressed his thumb against. As it accepted his blood, the ring spoke, prime user registered, Tony flicked his wrist and sucked his thumb. He then walked towards his desk. With just a thought, he caused the back of the ring to open and connected it to the computer, transferring the coding he had previously created to the ring. The coding has been successfully transferred, Friday informed Tony. Tony nodded, smirking as he backed away. 
He lifted his hand, causing the ring to start floating upwards, glowing with silver and blue. The ring shot out from where it was standing, tearing itself from the cables that connected it to the computer. The ring landed in Tony's hand, where he snatched it and slid it onto his ring finger. Silver and blue light began to swirl over his body. On his chest appeared the image of the Stark reactor as he began floating upwards. The silver-blue lantern reporting for duty, Tony smirked. I know this is going to sound corny, but I'm going to make myself an oath. An oath for the first official Resolve Lantern Corps. Tony put a hand on his chin and pondered for a minute, considering different words, before he smirked. I got it. Tony held out his fist, where the silver-blue ring was present and glowing. It began to glow brighter as Tony closed his eyes and began to say, In darkest night or blinding light, my will of steel will forever fight. For in my heart, I know who I am, my resolve unbreakable. I am Iron Man. Third person's POV. All right, Friday, on a scale from 1 to 10, how cool was I just now? Tony asked with a smirk. A 6, Friday replied. What? Surely you're just hating. That was a solid 8 or 9, Tony scoffed. Looks like you really need an upgrade if you can't tell the difference, Friday. He sighed, shaking his head as he turned his attention back to the glowing ring on his finger. The idea behind this ring is to make my thoughts reality. But it's only useful if you're creative enough to wield it. A silver-blue light flashed around Tony, and in an instant, a miniature basketball court materialized around him. Several hard light constructs of himself appeared, all charging at him as he conjured a basketball in his hands. Bouncing the ball skillfully, Tony weaved between the constructs, effortlessly dribbling past them as they attempted to steal the ball. He moved with fluid grace, dodging each of his doubles, until he leaped into the air, slamming the ball down with a powerful dunk that shattered one of the constructs. The court and the remaining doubles vanished as quickly as they had appeared. Tony held out his hand, and a glowing long sword formed in his grasp. He spun it effortlessly before assuming a battle stance. With a swift swing, he sliced clean through one of the chairs in the lab, the cut so precise it was almost seamless. Tony stood still, momentarily stunned. This is... more dangerous than I expected. What were you expecting, boss? Your weaponizing light an extremely volatile element when concentrated, Friday remarked. Concentrated, Tony muttered, his eyes beginning to glow. Two laser beams shot from them, scorching the metal floor beneath his feet. Heat vision, baby, Tony exclaimed, thrusting his fist into the air. He spread his arms wide, and several floating eyes appeared around him, their glowing irises gathering energy. Boss, Please tell me you're not going to fire those in here. We have a danger room for a reason. Use that, Friday urged. With a snap of his fingers, all the constructs disappeared. Good call, Friday. I'm so glad I thought of it, Tony said, heading for the training room. Yes, boss, you're an amazing intellectual being, Friday replied dryly. Ah, thanks, Friday. That was sarcasm, boss. One of my many unnecessary features. Ignoring her... Tony entered the danger room. All right, Friday, the scenario is this. I'm an intergalactic space warrior battling an army of space pirates. If you say so, boss, Friday responded. The room around Tony transformed into the vastness of space. Aliens and ships appeared, all with their weapons trained on him. Tony smirked as he extended his arms, forming a massive Gatling gun and immediately unleashing a barrage of bullets. The gun shook in his hands as he fired, a crazed smile forming on his face. As the enemies retaliated with lasers and beams, Tony encased himself in a golem-like construct, protecting him from the onslaught. The golem wielded a giant, spiked morning star, swinging it around and decimating everything in its path. It pulled the chain, redirecting the weapon to obliterate more targets. The construct around Tony shifted again. With a thought, it transformed into a hulking Iron Man suit made of pure energy. Its repulsors glowed brightly, charging up before firing two massive beams of concentrated light that tore through the remaining enemies. Now that's what I call efficient, Tony muttered, satisfied. End simulation.
The room reverted to its normal state, revealing the damage left behind. Tony stretched and yawned. I think I've got the hang of this thing. He waved a hand, returning to his normal clothes. Friday, clean this up and make another ring for tomorrow. Good night. Sure thing. Good night, boss, Friday replied. Tony made his way back to his room, changing into something comfortable before slipping into bed beside Melissa. She stirred, smiling as she snuggled up to him. They both drifted off into a peaceful sleep, wrapped in each other's warmth. The next morning, after breakfast, Melissa joined Tony in his lab. So, what was it you made last night? She asked, her curiosity piqued by his secrecy. Tony grinned mischievously as he spotted a ring box on his desk. He picked it up and, to Melissa's surprise, dropped to one knee holding the box out. Melissa shield, would you? She gasped, tears welling up in her eyes as she covered her mouth. Seeing her reaction, Tony froze, his expression shifting to one of horror. Oh no! Seeing your reaction is making me hate myself for making this joke. W what? Melissa's voice was quiet, her emotions on edge. You were joking? This seemed so much funnier in my head, Tony admitted, standing up awkwardly. I think I might have gone a bit too far. The guilt hit him hard as he saw Melissa's sad, howdy expression. You're cruel, Anthony Stark. Oof. Full name. Tony groaned, clutching his chest dramatically. What's in the box, then? It's a ring, but... Not what you think, Tony explained, opening the box to reveal a sleek, tech-enhanced ring. Let me guess. It's for a suit, isn't it? Melissa asked, raising an eyebrow as she wiped her tears. Tony nodded, looking apologetic. If I'd known how much this meant to you, I wouldn't have done it. Melissa sighed, shaking her head. No, I'm sorry for overreacting. We're only 15, and we've only been dating for a few months. I guess I got carried away. Wait. So if I had proposed for real, would you have said yes? Tony asked, curious. Melissa blushed, her cheeks turning bright red. Are you proposing now? Uh, no. Then I'll answer that question when you actually do. Tony's turn to blush. Okay. That was smooth as hell. Melissa giggled, her embarrassment fading. She quickly changed the subject. All right, so what does the ring actually do? Tony smirked as he held up his ring, snapping his fingers. The words, hard light constructs, appeared in bold letters floating in the air before them. I see. Interesting. Melissa murmured, taking the ring from the box in Tony's hand and examining it closely. As she turned it over, a small needle popped out from the back. Go ahead, Tony nodded. Melissa hesitated for a moment before pricking her finger. The ring responded instantly, Primal user registered. Now what? Melissa asked, looking at Tony with a raised eyebrow. Now you put it on, Tony replied with a grin. As she slid the ring onto her finger, it spoke again, scanning for host's most optimal emotion. Scanning complete. Emotion selected. Melissa glanced at Tony, clearly puzzled, but he simply gestured for her to be patient. Congratulations, user. On becoming the Lantern of Compassion, the ring's color shifted to a glowing silver and purple. And in a flash, a sleek suit began to materialize over Melissa's body. She looked down at the suit in surprise and then back at Tony, confused. Okay, you still haven't explained what this ring does, aside from reading my emotions and giving me this strange suit. Oh, right. Tony grinned sheepishly. The ring is tied to your imagination. Whatever you think of, you can create using hard light constructs. Like this, with a thought, Tony summoned a small mecha suit over his body, complete with a massive glowing sword. Whoa! Melissa gasped, tapping the construct with her knuckles. It's solid. Tony nodded. Yup, these constructs are powered by our strongest emotions. My ring is fueled by my resolve, and yours by your compassion. Melissa frowned slightly, her expression shifting from awe to concern. Tony, are you okay? Is something going on? You can talk to me, you know. Tony raised an eyebrow. Why wouldn't I be? Because I know you. 
You'd never rely on something as unpredictable as emotions to power anything. That's why I'm worried. Tony met her gaze, his expression unreadable. I'm just testing something out. That's all. If you say so, Melissa muttered, still watching him carefully. Tony rolled his eyes and shook his head. I hate you sometimes, you know that? Melissa chuckled softly, leaning in to kiss his cheek. I love you too, my love, third person's POV. I still kind of prefer my Mark 40 suit, Melissa said, looking at the ring on her finger as she caressed it with her thumb. Tony shrugged, then use it. No one said we have to wear the same suits together. I suppose you're right. I just thought it was cute how we wore the same suits, you know? Like couple goals, Melissa said with a blush. Tony laughed and kissed her lips. You're adorable. You know that. I'll wear my Mark 40 suit, but I'll leave the ring on just in case. Melissa, you can do whatever you please. You don't have to tell me. I know, I was just saying. So, shall we get going? Melissa asked as she grabbed her Mark 40 suit. As Tony and Melissa flew out of their lab, Tony was surrounded by a silver-blue light. His hands were out as he disappeared from Melissa's view. Did you turn invisible? Melissa asked. Tony, who had just arrived at the military base where they always met Star and Stripes, tapped his ear. No, I'm already here. I just flew at the speed of light. What? Melissa shouted in shock. Heh, you sure are slow. I'm tired of waiting, Tony smirked. That's insane and impossible. How are you not disintegrated? Melissa asked in awe. It's the suit that uses the light to propel itself forward, while also protecting my body from any negative effects that traveling at such speed might cause. Although I'm a bit woozy, I can manage that, Tony explained. Now, how much longer do I have to wait for you exactly? I hate you. Love you too, honey, Tony teased. Meanwhile, at UA, in Nizu's office, Nizu was signing a stack of papers when a knock was heard on his door. Come in, he said, not looking up from what he was doing. In came Eraser Head and Present Mike. You wanted to see us? Aizawa asked in a tired voice due to the early hour. Nizu sighed as he put his pen down and looked toward them with a serious expression. They were taken aback, as they almost always saw him as a happy, jolly mouse. Yo, yo, why so serious? Present Mike asked in a loud tone. Aizawa groaned and turned his head away. Do you have to be so loud so early? I have unfortunate news that has been brought to my attention, and it's imperative that I share it with you. But before that, where's All Might? I thought I told him this was a serious matter. Hearing there was unfortunate news, Aizawa and Present Mike exchanged concerned glances. Present Mike spoke in a normal tone. He shouldn't be far off. You know how he is. He probably got distracted saving someone in danger again. Aizawa looked concerned. Unfortunate news? What kind of unfortunate news? Are the students okay? None of them died during their internships, did they? Concern was evident in his expression and voice. Oh goodness, no. This doesn't have to do with the students. They're all okay and on their way to their internships, except for Tenya Ida who had to be hospitalized. He's relatively okay. Aizawa looked confused but let out a small sigh, relieved to hear his students were safe. If it's not about the students, then what is it? Aizawa wondered as he and Present Mike sat down in the chairs in front of Nizu's desk, waiting for All Might. All Might arrived three minutes later, rushing in. Sorry I'm late, he said, catching his breath. I got distracted. People needed saving. Nizu sighed. While your heroic spirit is something to admire and something I love about you, please try to be more on time. What I have to share is very important. All Might rubbed the back of his head, a bit embarrassed. I'm sorry. I'll be more careful next time. Now then, I want to start by saying that this information has been brought to my attention by none other than Anthony Stark. He's the one who did the research and connected all the dots. Principal man, you're seriously making me nervous with how you're acting right now, Present Mike said, a hint of nervousness in his tone. Nizu grabbed the computer mouse next to him and made a few clicks before turning to face them. Let's start with this. Do you remember Kiro Jairi, the villain you fought together? Ah, the misty guy. Of course, I remember. What about him? 
President Mike asked. Mr. Stark managed to collect a DNA sample from Kurojiri during the Hosu incident, and the result of what he found. Let's just say it's better if you see it for yourselves. Mizu turned his monitor to show them the screen. Aizawa and present Mick's eyes widened as their pupils shrank. They pushed their chairs back, standing up and slamming their hands on the desk, knocking over some of Nizu's paperwork. No, that can't be, Aizawa muttered. That's impossible, present Mike said, equally shocked. On the screen were two files, one of Oboro Shirakumo and the other of Kurojiri. At the bottom were the words, DNA 100% match. Nizu, this isn't funny. Not even a little bit, present Mike said, his tone shifting from its usual relaxed nature to a serious one. How can this be? He's dead. We both saw his body. He didn't have a pulse, nor was he breathing. And his quirk wasn't anything like Kiro Jairi's. Aizawa said, his voice tense. That's because he's been turned into a nomu, a sort of undead. His quirk must have been altered as well, by none other than. All for one, All Might interrupted Venom in his voice. So, he really is alive. Until now, it was merely speculation. But it seems even with the injuries he sustained, he managed to survive. We were in front of him and didn't even know it. Present Mike said, a frown forming on his face. He didn't even recognize us. Aizawa muttered. Present Mike ran his fingers through his hair. Frustration evident. Okay, now I'm seriously pissed off. To think that the corpse of our best friend was used for something like this. Aizawa sighed and nodded towards Nizu. Thank you for bringing this to our attention. Don't thank me, thank Anthony Stark. He's the one who discovered this and told me to inform you all. Aizawa nodded, while present Mike sat there gritting his teeth. His hands clenched so tightly his knuckles turned white. Is that why you called me? To inform me about all for one's return? All Might asked, sensing there was more Nizu wanted to share. I wish that was all. Nizu shook his head. You weren't present, so you didn't get to see him. But during the attack on the USJ, there was another villain with Kurojiri. A boy named Tamura Shigaraki. The flaky kid with the blue hair, right? Present Mike asked. Nizu nodded. He's related to someone you know personally. Nizu grabbed the monitor, made a few clicks, and turned it towards All Might. He's the grandson of your late master, Nana Shimura. All Might stared at the screen, disbelief washing over him. What? His voice was low and full of shock. He's in the hands of All for One. Isn't he? We have to go rescue him. Who knows what that monster has done to that poor boy? Stop. Nizu held out his paw, seeing All Might ready to spring into action. Anthony Stark managed to track their location. They're in a bar. But before we make any moves, we're going to gather the heroes and prepare a plan. I know this means a lot to all three of you, but I need you to be patient. The time will come. Right now, I want you to take a moment to process what you're feeling and thinking clearly before we act. By this afternoon, we should have everything ready to make our move. Third person's POV. When Melissa appeared before Tony, she looked at him with a straight expression. Tony was sitting on a beach chair, one hand behind his head and a drink in the other. Tony lowered his construct glasses and looked at Melissa while fake yawning. You sure took your sweet time getting here, didn't you? It still doesn't make sense how you managed to travel at the speed of light, Melissa said, narrowing her eyes. Tony smirked, I used your suit as a base for it. You know how your suit lets you harness quantum tunneling and phase through matter. Well, my suit is similar, but instead of quantum tunneling, it's with light. It lets me travel with the light it releases and harnesses. Tony stood up from where he was sitting, letting the light constructs dissipate. At that moment, stars and stripes landed in Tony's superhero landing pose. Copycat, Tony teased as he saw stars and stripes slowly stand up. Oh, please, like you're the first person to ever do that, stars scoffed. I just wanted to show you how arrogant you looked when you did it. It felt great, didn't it? Tony smirked. Stars pinched her fingers. A bit, she admitted with amusement. She raised an eyebrow as she looked Tony up and down. New suit. Always, Tony replied, 
flexing a bicep and extending his arm to the side, showing off his new suit. So, what are we doing today? Melissa asked curiously. Client Protection Services, Stars said, getting serious. I see, so it's when people hire heroes to be their bodyguards for the day or for an event, right? Melissa inferred. This must be important if you're accepting it, Tony remarked, knowing hiring the number one hero in the United States couldn't be cheap. Stars and Stripes nodded. We're tasked with defending the President of the United States while he goes abroad for international dealings. Cool. Tony and Melissa smirked. Do we get to know what this deal is about? Tony asked. No, since it's confidential to the nation. Even I, the one tasked with protection, and the number one hero here don't fully know what the dealings are. We're just doing our job, Stars explained. Yeah, that isn't ominous at all, Tony muttered. Are we even allowed to go with you? Since we're just, you know, interns? Melissa asked. I already got confirmation yesterday. You two have nothing to worry about. They said the more protection, the better, so you're good to go, Stars informed them. Can we at least know where we're going? Tony asked. We're going to Europe. Wait, how long is this trip? Tony asked. Three days. Basically the duration of your internship. Three days. Tony and Melissa shouted in unison. Damn it. Tony muttered. Is something wrong? You can't make it. Stars asked curiously. When do we leave? Tony asked. In approximately two hours. Tony's shoulders slumped. Give me a minute. I'll need to make a couple of phone calls. Oh, you can take your time. Like I said, you won't be needed for two hours, so get your things in order. Clothing, essentials, all that. Stars waved them off. All right, all right. Tony said, blowing a raspberry with his lips before stepping aside. We'll meet you in an hour and a half. Let's go, Melissa. Tony said, blasting off into the sky. Tony began punching and kicking the air. Ark! Melissa looked at him weirdly, concerned. Tony, what's going on? Today, Nizu and I plan to ambush the villains who attacked USJ. He's already gathering the heroes to launch an attack this afternoon. And that's not all, the main big bad might make an appearance. I want to be part of that, but I also really want to go to Europe and defend the president. That sounds so badass. And I don't want to miss it. Tony said, spinning in the air as he vented to Melissa. Not to mention, I promised my mom I'd spend time with her today, and I really don't want to let her down. Tony added, disappointed. Melissa sighed at Tony's dilemma. Well, isn't a big part of being a hero about making sacrifices? Sometimes we can't have it all. Tony stopped and stared at Melissa for a moment. What? Melissa asked, confused. You sound like a poor person. Only poor people make sacrifices and can't have it all in the world, Tony remarked. Melissa gave Tony a deadpan expression. I'm being serious and trying to support you. Well, your support sucks. You're my assistant. You should be helping me figure everything out. Not telling me to make sacrifices, Tony created a shark with jet engines using his ring and sat on it as it swam through the air, deep in thought. Melissa's eye twitched and she fought the urge to blast Tony out of the sky. Tony brainstormed different ideas for a few moments. He was slapping his forehead with his palm for a few seconds before snapping his fingers. I've got it. I'll use the two hours I have left to get everything in order and spend time with my mom. Then we can go to Europe for the internship and protect the president. While we're there, I'll control one of my suits remotely to oversee the ambush and make sure everything goes according to plan. I can even send Baymax as a backup. Here is the revised version with corrected spelling and grammar. Tony beamed with pride at his own genius. Look at that, I don't need to make a phone call after all. Okay, maybe I lied. Friday, call my spawn point. If you have your own mother as spawn point, which, by the way, is really weird, what do you have me saved as? Tony glanced at her and smirked. Wifey, Melissa blushed slightly, not expecting that. She had thought it would be something weird. Tony? Is something the matter, honey? Maria asked with concern, not expecting Tony's call. Are you busy right now? Tony asked. Maria looked at her desk stacked with papers and folders, then pursed her lips and shook her head. Nope, I'm as free as a bird. Do you need something? Ah yeah. 
Do you remember how I said I'd try to make time for you today? Well, are you canceling on me? Maria asked sadly. Tony could practically hear her shoulders slump as she asked that. No, I'm asking if I could use that time now. I'm going on a business trip and have a few hours of free time. I won't get another chance for the next three days. Business trip? What business trip? To where? Well, it's part of my internship with Stars and Stripes. We're going to Europe, and I'm going to be protecting the president, Tony said proudly. Haha, that sounds important. Well, I'm glad you called to inform me and are making time for your dear old mom. I'll be waiting. All right, I'll see you soon. With that, Tony hung up the call. Mama's boy, Melissa teased. Tony just made a hard light construct of a middle finger in her direction as they headed back home. Melissa simply laughed, holding her stomach, finding his reaction, and the middle finger construct. Hilarious. Third person's POV. After getting everything sorted, Tony and Melissa flew off to Tony's family home, where they found Maria waiting for them by the front entrance. Sorry for intruding, Melissa said, looking toward Maria apologetically. Maria gave her a hug before kissing the top of her head. Oh, nonsense. You should know I've long since seen you as my own daughter. Melissa blushed at the attention Maria was giving her. Maria then looked teasingly toward Tony and Melissa. Not to mention, when the two of you get married, you'll officially become my daughter-in-law. Melissa covered her face in embarrassment while Tony rolled his eyes and shook his head as he walked past them into the house. Tony and Melissa then spent time with Maria, waiting for the time to leave. A few hours earlier, as Kirojiri headed to the doctor to get treated, Teo appeared carrying some tools. So, Kirojiri couldn't get these cuffs off you? Teo asked, raising an eyebrow. Tamura slapped the cuffs onto the bar table. They would be OFF if he could. He shouted, looking furious. Calm down. I was just asking a question. Now, let's see here. Teo began examining the cuffs, running his fingers along the material, trying to find a keyhole or opening. That's weird. He mumbled. What is it? Tamura sighed. These... These don't have any openings, like they weren't meant to be opened. The tips of Teo's fingers began to pulse with electricity due to his quirk. As Teo brought his fingers closer, an invisible energy was released, causing his quirk to dissipate. Fascinating, Teo muttered, focusing his eye quirk on the cuffs in front of him. What? What is it? How do I explain this in a way that makes sense? Different types of energy have different wavelengths. Whoever made these cuffs figured out the wavelength needed to disrupt quirks. And that's not all. It also disrupts the effects of quirks, which is why Kirojiri couldn't take them off you. It's honestly genius, Teo said in awe. This thing you're praising was created by none other than Tony Stark. So keep praising it, Tamura scoffed. Teo grimaced. As much as I hate that kid, there's no denying his genius. I'd be a fool to deny it. But that's beside the point. Enough talking. Get this thing off me. Tamura snapped. I was getting to the second problem, Teo continued. From what I can tell, this thing only opens with a specific energy wavelength. So, figuring that out will be extremely difficult. Tamura groaned in frustration and began smashing the cuffs against the bar table again like a child throwing a tantrum. If you can't use a quirk, then make something technological and blast this thing open. Teo tapped the cuffs inside. These cuffs are extremely durable. Most of what I have or could make probably wouldn't work. I could try making a molecule disruptor, but it would take me about a month to build. So, you'll have to live with these for at least that long. A month? Hell no. I have things to do. Get them off now. Seiki, all for one called out ominously. I'll give you a week to figure it out. A week? That's impossible. I'd have to go without sleep for days, which would only slow me down, Teo said, trying to reason with him. Make use of the gifts I've given you. Seiki, you have one week. I don't need to say more. Teo clicked his tongue. All right, all right. No need to threaten me. He grumbled ruffling his hair in frustration. What? Does that mean I'll be stuck like this for an entire week? That's bullshit. 
Tamura shouted, repeatedly slamming the cuffs on the table, trying to break them off. Tamura, hearing all for one call his name, Tamura froze. Think of this as punishment for losing to the heroes a second time, all for one said with amusement. And Seiki, wait until Kirojiri recovers before you begin. Tamura clicked his tongue and began sulking. Now he's treating me like a little kid again, present. Tony and Melissa were now saying their goodbyes to Maria as they had to be on their way. Maria hugged both of them dearly. I'm gonna miss you too while you're away. Tony looked at Maria strangely. We've been away from home for far longer. What are you on about? Shoo. Sure. Just let me have this moment, Maria whispered. Tony rolled his eyes in exasperation before they both stepped back. They transformed into their hero suits and blasted off into the air. Maria waved them goodbye before heading back inside once they were out of sight. They rapidly flew through the air, making their way to the location Star and Stripes had given them. Soon, they arrived at what appeared to be a private airspace, where a private jet awaited them. Tony and Melissa slowly descended and saw Star and Stripes waiting for them. As usual, you two are punctual, Star said, nodding her head in appreciation. So, where's the president? Tony asked, looking around in confusion. He's on his way as we speak. Ah, uh, there they are, Star said, looking ahead where multiple cars appeared with a limousine in the middle. From one of the cars, a man dressed in all black with sunglasses and an earpiece stepped up and opened the door to the limousine. Out came a man with thick black hair and a beard, wearing a tight three-piece suit that appeared snug due to his large frame and muscles. He adjusted his blazer before holding out his hand. A soft, delicate hand took his, and he helped a woman step out. She was dressed in a beautiful green pencil skirt and formal wear. The man confidently approached them and nodded at Star and Stripes. Star, he said. Mr. President, Star nodded. The president then turned to Tony and Melissa. So, you must be the young Stark. As you may know, I'm Jonathan Steele, the president of the United States, he said, extending his hand to Tony. A part of Tony's suit retracted from his hand as he shook the president's hand. Tony Stark, the one and only, Tony smirked. Strong grip you've got there. Son, Jonathan nodded, impressed. I could say the same about you, sir. The president chuckled before turning to Melissa. And you must be Ms. Shield. I've met your father once. He's a good man. Melissa Shield. Sir. Thank you, Melissa replied respectfully. The president then placed a hand on the green-haired woman beside him. This is my wife. Evelyn Steele. She'll be joining us during our travels, so please protect her as you would me. He said with a serious expression. Tony gave a two-finger salute. Leave it to us. She'll be in capable hands. The president laughed boisterously while his wife, the first lady, giggled behind her hand. From what I've seen and heard about you two, I don't doubt that, the president said, patting Tony's shoulder. Now then, let's get going. I want to get this over with as soon as possible, said the president. As they were boarding the plane, Tony asked Star and Stripes, so how are we going to do this? You could be inside with them while Melissa and I guard the plane from the outside. That's not a bad idea. Sure, let's go with that, Star and Stripes agreed. Keep me informed if you spot anything suspicious. This is important so you can't act on your own. You won't have as much freedom as during the last mission. Yes, ma'am, Tony said giving a two-finger salute once more. Star and Stripes nodded, satisfied, and headed inside the plane with the president, while Tony and Melissa floated off the ground. The plane began to taxi down the runway, with Tony and Melissa flying alongside each wing. As the plane took off, they kept pace, ensuring the president's safety. Third person's POV. Tony and Melissa were casually flying in the air, with the private jet carrying the president between them. With nothing else to do, Melissa began talking to Tony through their comms. So, what do you want to talk about? I'm actually studying while we fly. Are you serious right now? Melissa asked in a deadpan tone. Melissa, there's literally nothing to do, and I'm bored out of my mind. Tony, we just left the airstrip five minutes ago. I know, and this could take a while. We have to go at a certain speed, so I decided to use this time to study. 
You know, that's actually very smart. What are you studying? Quantum science. Your suit motivated me to revisit it. I'm curious about what other types of suits we could create using quantum science. So, you really like my suit, huh? Melissa said proudly. Yeah, yeah, gloat all you want. I'll be making a suit ten times better than yours, Tony scoffed. Melissa sighed. It's sad that I don't doubt that in the slightest. Well, I appreciate your confidence in me nonetheless, Tony said with a smirk. Melissa started pressing her fingers together nervously. So, do you mind if I study alongside you? She asked, a blush growing on her cheeks. Not in the slightest, Tony said with a smile. Is it all right to leave the plane unsupervised? Melissa asked uncertainly. Don't worry about that. Friday is keeping an eye on everything. She'd spot something before we did and let us know. I suppose you're right, Melissa said, letting go of her worries and joining Tony in his study of quantum physics. Whenever Melissa didn't understand something, she'd ask Tony, and he'd explain it, which helped reinforce his own knowledge of the subject. They spent the entire flight talking and discussing multiple topics and theories about quantum science, physics, chemistry, mechanics, and even the quantum realm. I don't normally curse, but holy shit, Tony, if we could actually navigate the quantum realm, we could end up in an alternate reality. That's insane. Melissa exclaimed in awe. Tony chuckled. Crazy, right? Honestly, all of this is making me want to abandon this mission, go home, and lock myself in my lab. Uh, Melissa. Hearing Tony's sudden shift, Melissa looked at him in confusion. Yep, yeah, I think we might have gotten too excited and forgotten something. What is it? I'm pretty sure we packed everything we needed. Even if we're missing something, Friday can deliver it. It's not something, it's someone. Melissa's eyes widened. Oh my God, May. She facebombed. Why did you have to get an intern as well, Tony? Just why? May's a lovely girl who loves inventing. Couldn't let go of such talent. She's a diamond in the rough. Be honest. If May was a boy, would you have helped? That question is irrelevant. Oh no, it's very relevant, to me at least. So don't dodge it, Tony. I plead the fifth. You can shove your fifth amendment right up your a dollar hashtag and insert cursing that can make a sailor blush Melissa, Tony gasped. Wait till your father hears about this. He'd be so disappointed. Are you going to answer the question or not? Tony cleared his throat. I won't answer directly, but I'll say this. There are already enough male inventors. As a great feminist, I want to give the ladies a boost. Give them opportunities they might not get in this unfair world. If this plane wasn't between us, I would blast you out of the sky for that comment. Tony sent her kissy faces through the comms. Love you too. Melissa rolled her eyes. So what are you going to do about May? I feel kind of bad. The best I could think of is letting Friday be the one to start teaching her while we're not around. And Friday isn't a bad teacher all things considered. For one, she's an AI. And secondly, she's watched me work through mostly everything. So she would be able to teach May plenty. But before she could retort, the jet began to descend. They realized they had spent the entire flight bickering and studying together without noticing how much time had passed. Tony and Melissa descended alongside the jet as it landed on the runway. A line of black cars waited in the distance. As the jet came to a full stop, Tony and Melissa stood by the opposite side of the jet door as it opened. First came the president, followed by the first lady, and behind them was Star and Stripes. The president looked at them and smiled. Thanks for the escort, you two. I never did get your hero names. Tony flashed a peace sign. Iron Man. Melissa subconsciously saluted and clicked her heels together. The Iron Maiden, sir. Ah. Matching hero names. How adorable, said Evelyn, the first lady, smiling. The president nodded with a smirk. Thanks for the escort, Iron Man and Iron Maiden, he said, leading them toward the cars. Tony glanced at Melissa in confusion, mouthing, Why did you click your heels and salute? Melissa looked mortified and on the verge of tears. He asked for my hero name, and I panicked. Tony had to cover his mouth to stop from laughing. Star and Stripes then motioned for them to follow as they all got into the same limousine as the president. 
President Jonathan and First Lady Evelyn sat on one side, while Star and Stripes sat on the other. As they settled in, Melissa looked confused. Evelyn noticed and smiled. If you have a question, please feel free to ask. No need to be shy. Ah, uh, well, wouldn't it be better if we sat in different cars to guard you properly? It's fine for Star to be here, but wouldn't it be better if Tony sat in the front while I sat in the back? It doesn't really matter, Tony said. Leaning back and closing his eyes, Melissa looked at Tony in confusion, while the others smiled. We're not actually here to protect the president, Tony continued. The guards around us are more than enough. They're highly trained, and they have powerful quirks. Star is more of a show of power. We're here for the same reason, to show off but through our technology. We wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for that. Melissa blinked in surprise. Tony patted her head. Don't worry your pretty little head about it. Politics isn't your strongest subject. President Jonathan laughed. You're a stark through and through kid. Pretty smart. I wouldn't be here if I wasn't. The president laughed heartily at Tony's response. Third person's POV. You know, if you're going to use me to showcase technological advancements, you might as well tell me what this meeting is actually about, Tony said, raising an eyebrow at the president. That seems fair, the president nodded. It's mostly to reaffirm our alliance against rising quark-related threats, share advanced technologies, and explore potential quark research collaborations. That's it. Tony blinked. The president tilted his head. Confused. What were you expecting? I don't know, like some secret quark war brewing in the shadows or maybe a covert alliance to take down China or something as equally dangerous. When you said dangerous, you really meant cool, didn't you? Melissa sighed. Didn't want to seem insensitive, Tony shrugged. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint. The president looked unsure how to respond. The first day here is for rest, so everyone will be in their best shape for tomorrow's meeting. You two have the rest of the day off, stars and stripes nodded towards Tony. Tony's eyebrow twitched. That would have been nice to know earlier. You can't leave the country and come back though, just to be clear. I know you're fast, but it's still a violation, she warned. Never mind, then. Tony muttered. They soon arrived at Moscow's most luxurious hotel. A 100-story building practically shimmering in gold. After checking in, Star returned with two keys. I don't know how you two do things, she began, handing them the keys, but I got you a room with two beds. It's close to mine and the president's. Even though you have free time, remember you're representing a nation, so be responsible. Look who you're talking to. I'm Tony Stark. My middle name is Responsible. I thought it was Edward? Melissa teased. Tony shot her a slow, incredulous look. I'm going to pretend you didn't just say that. Star chuckled. It's because I know who you are that I'm telling you to be responsible. Relax. All I'm going to do is take Melissa out on a date. Really? Melissa asked, surprised and delighted. Tony shrugged. Yeah, we haven't been on one in a while, so why not? Well, you kids enjoy yourselves. Stars and stripes waved them off. As they left the hotel, their hero suits deactivated morphing back into their civilian clothes. Tony slipped on his sunglasses, walking with his hands casually in his pockets, while Melissa clung to his arm, resting her head on his shoulder. So, are we just going to walk? Melissa asked. You don't want to? No, I do. It's just that we're always flying or moving super fast. Feels nice to just walk. Take it slow. Speaking of the view, Tony said. Glancing around, we need new clothes, why? What's wrong with what we have? Well, for starters, we're in Moscow. We've got to dress the part, take some photos, and brag to everyone about our fancy trip to Europe while they're stuck wherever they are. Surrounded by high-end shops, they soon found themselves at one of the largest clothing stores. Mannequins displaying stylish outfits and accessories in the windows. Melissa's excitement spiked for reasons Tony couldn't quite grasp. You know, being able to make any clothes I want is one thing, but shopping for them? That's a whole new level of fun, she said, eyes gleaming as she studied the racks of clothing. She picked up a pair of fashionable pants, holding them up to her body and turning toward Tony with a hand on her hip. What do you think? You look good in anything, honey, 
Tony said with an awkward smile, opting for the safe answer. Melissa gave him a straight-faced look. I'm being serious. So was I. You seriously do look good in anything. Melissa pinched his cheeks. I appreciate the compliment, but that's not helping me pick out what I want. All right, fine. Let's see. The beige color matches your skin tone, but that's about it. The blue, on the other hand, will really make your features pop. Your green eyes, blonde hair, and overall vibe. Why do I even bother asking? Melissa's shoulders slumped. What did I do? I did exactly what you asked. Tony said, exasperated. That was too much. A simple, you look good, would have been enough. Woman, that's quite literally what I said before. Melissa held out her finger. No, you said I look good in anything I wear. That's totally different from saying if this looks good on me or not. Tony sighed and pinched the bridge of his nose. If I said everything looks good on you, obviously I'm implying that what you're holding will also look good on you. See, that's the thing, Tony. I don't want implications. I just want a simple yes or no answer. Melissa. Yes. Melissa asked with a smile, batting her eyelashes at him with an amused expression. This is honestly our first shopping trip together, and you're already a pain in the ass. Melissa just looked proud of herself as she turned around, whipped her hair back, and then looked over her shoulder with a wink. As your girlfriend, that is simply my job. Nice to see it's working. Tony looked at her with a straight expression. I'm leaving, he said, spinning on his heel. Wait, wait, wait. Melissa called out, grabbing his arm and laughing. I'm being serious now. Let's try on some clothes. She grinned, looking at him with a big smile. Tony sighed but went along with her. Melissa picked out a few outfits for them both before pulling Tony outside the changing room. She then began to perform a miniature fashion show for him. She appeared first, wearing a frilly pink skirt with a black top, spinning around barefoot and holding the hem of her dress. So, what do you think? It's all right, Tony shrugged. Melissa chuckled, noticing Tony rapidly tapping the side of his glasses, secretly taking multiple pictures of her. She closed the curtain, then reappeared in black dress pants with heels, a white dress shirt, and a black blazer. She leaned back on the door frame, one leg up, winking at Tony before closing the curtain again. Next, she emerged in baggy black sweatpants, a white crop top, and sunglasses, her hair now tied in a ponytail. She lowered her glasses to her nose, winked, pushed them back up, and disappeared behind the curtain. Pfft. Tony stifled a laugh at her antics. When the curtains opened again, Melissa was dressed in a large black fur coat with mittens and a fuzzy black hat with a red star in the middle. She opened her coat, waddled in a 360-degree turn, then closed the curtains and returned in her original outfit, carrying all the clothes. Now go put on a show for me, big boy. Tony sighed as he stood up. As he walked past her, he scoffed. I'm about to slay harder than anyone has ever slayed in their lives. Melissa chuckled as she took his seat. It wasn't long before Tony appeared, wearing black dress pants with small gray stripes and a black shirt, partially unbuttoned to show his chest. His glasses were perched on top of his head as he looked off into the distance. Whoa! Melissa cheered, clapping rapidly, almost making Tony break character. He flipped the curtain closed before arrogantly opening it again. This time, he wore white pants and a light blue shirt, with different, rounder glasses hanging off the tip of his nose. He leaned against the door frame and looked at Melissa seductively. Ms. Shield, your piano lessons will begin shortly. Oh my, Melissa muttered, fluttering her eyelashes. Tony twirled dramatically and closed the curtain. When he opened it again, he was in brown pants, a long brown coat, and a scarf hanging loosely around his shoulders, topped off with a hat. He flipped the scarf over his shoulder and leaned back on the doorframe, holding onto his hat while looking down. Melissa whistled sharply, then clapped her hands. By the end, they were both laughing at the ridiculousness of it all. Third person's POV. Tony and Melissa sat at a table, happily eating burgers, surrounded by shopping bags filled with clothes. As they ate, Melissa glanced around suspiciously, 
checking if anyone was watching, and subtly slid her foot toward Tony. Tony paused mid-bite, chewing slowly as he eyed her suspiciously. Melissa, what are you doing? He asked, swallowing his food. What does it look like I'm doing? Melissa replied, raising an eyebrow. It looks like you're rubbing your foot against mine. So why? I'm experimenting, she said, a slight blush creeping onto her cheeks. Huh? Tony responded, clearly amused. Melissa blushed a little deeper. I saw this in a movie once. I thought it was kind of hot, and I wanted to try it at least once. Tony scoffed playfully, taking a sip of his drink. What kind of movies are you watching where rubbing feet is exciting? Melissa looked around nervously, her blush intensifying. It's not the foot rubbing I was talking about. Tony raised an eyebrow, curious. Melissa shifted in her seat, reaching down beside her, and after a bit of wiggling, she discreetly pulled out a small blue piece of lingerie. Tony nearly choked on his drink. What the? He coughed slightly, eyes wide. Melissa blushed even more. Give me your hand. Still processing what was happening, Tony patted his chest to recover and then extended his hand. Melissa placed something in his palm, closing his fingers around it. I'll be waiting in the women's bathroom, she whispered, standing up and walking away with a coy smile. Tony blinked, watching her retreat. As he looked around, he slowly opened his hand and found her scrunched up lingerie. His eyes widened, his face turning red. Whoever said women aren't freaks like us men clearly never met one. Tony muttered to himself, still blushing. After a moment to gather his thoughts, Tony steeled himself, shoved the lingerie into his pocket, and casually made his way toward the bathrooms. Seeing the men's room was empty, he turned invisible using his ring and discreetly slipped into the women's restroom. As he entered, he spotted Melissa's heels lying outside a stall door. With some relief, he noticed the bottom of the stall wasn't visible from outside. Tony knocked lightly on the stall door, and Melissa opened it just enough for him to slip inside before locking it behind them. Tony reappeared, turning toward her with a raised brow, taking in her deep blush. If you're so embarrassed, why are we doing this? He asked, amusement dancing in his voice. Melissa just continued to blush. What's wrong with wanting to experiment a bit with my boyfriend? She said as she slowly walked up and wrapped her arms over his neck. Tony subconsciously put his hands on her waist. I never said it's not wrong to experiment, but does it have to be in a bathroom? It's both a public and a private setting. I say it's perfect. She muttered as she brought his face down and kissed his lips. Tony brought her body closer to him and deepened the kiss, enjoying the taste of her cherry lips. As Melissa kissed him, her hands moved from his neck down to his chest and down to his pants, where she began unbuckling his belt. She then slowly pushed Tony to sit down on the closed toilet seat, where she got on top of him, began straddling him. His hands went around her to rest on her bottom. Check out the original story, link in the description, for what happens next. Third person's POV. As Tony and Melissa exited the restaurant, Tony glanced at her, shaking his head with a smirk. I didn't know you were capable of being such a degenerate. Melissa blushed, defending herself. I'm not a degenerate. I told you, I was just experimenting. Tony leaned in and whispered. Then why aren't you asking for your underwear back and are walking around commando? Melissa's face flushed deeper. Can we just get back to the hotel, please? Tony chuckled, teasingly dragging out his words. Cutting our date short already? I should really stretch it out. Make sure you stay like that as long as possible. Please don't. Melissa whispered almost pleading. Tony raised an eyebrow. Lucky for you, the hotel's actually where I need to be since the coordinated attack is going to happen soon. Melissa placed a hand on her chest and let out a sigh of relief as they made their way back to the hotel. Once they arrived, they stepped into their designated room, both taken aback by its size. They sure know how to take care of their guests here. Tony nodded appreciatively. Melissa smirked. I'm going to shower, Care to join me? She asked, raising an eyebrow. Tony glanced at the time, then shrugged. I've got time for a quick bath, sure. After some time, Tony emerged from the shower with wet hair and a satisfied expression. 
He grabbed the bags that had been brought to their room and changed into something comfortable. A black tank top and black sweatpants. Grabbing one of his bags, he slung it over his shoulder and moved to an open space. As Tony prepared, Melissa appeared, dressed in an oversized red sweater that hung past her shorts and covered most of her hands. Her hair was tied up in a messy bun, and her glasses rested atop her head. She sat down with a bowl of grapes watching Tony. Two things, Tony said, glancing at her. Is that my sweater? And is that a bowl of grapes? Melissa smiled mischievously. Yes and yes. The grapes were just sitting on the table with some other fruit. Want one? She rolled up her sleeve, grabbed a grape, and tossed it at him without even addressing the sweater. Tony opened his mouth, catching the grape perfectly. Then he got back to work. He opened his bag and pulled out a headband and a disc. He tossed the disc onto the floor, where it began expanding and unraveling, twirling into place until it formed a platform. Tony stepped onto it and placed the headband over his head. A soft light scanned over his body. In front of Tony, a large holographic screen appeared, displaying an image of his lab. As he lifted his hand, a red and gold holographic hand mirrored his movements. Tony got into a fighting stance, fists raised. He threw a punch, followed by a quick kick, and spun with a roundhouse, all of which were replicated in the hologram. As he spun, the screen followed his movements, allowing him to see different angles of his surroundings. Grape, Tony called out. Melissa, happy to oblige, tossed another grape, which he caught mid-motion without missing a beat. Friday, are there any delays in the response time? Tony asked, keeping his focus on the simulation. None, sir, Friday responded. It's a perfect mirror. No delays at all. Melissa, still munching on grapes, asked curiously, what suit are you using? The nano suit. It's my favorite right now. Super versatile, Tony said as he formed a glowing blue sword with his holographic hand, then quickly transformed it back into fingers. Melissa nodded, tossing another grape into her mouth. Well, I guess you'd better get going to see Nizu. In Tony's lab, a window slid open as the suit flew out, turning invisible and heading toward UA Academy. Tony, still lounging in the hotel with Melissa, remotely controlled the suit. As the suit scanned the area, Tony located Nizu in a secluded room, discussing a mission plan with a group of heroes and UA staff. An idea quickly formed in Tony's head. Since I'm not physically here, he thought, flying the suit closer, extending his hand to the walls, and letting the small nanotech slip through the cracks. Inside the room, Nizu pointed to a whiteboard with a pointer stick, explaining the strategy. We're not dealing with your typical supervillain here. He's right. This one's one of the most dangerous around. Tony's voice cut in suddenly, startling the group. Everyone jumped immediately on guard. Tony's suit deactivated its invisibility, revealing itself. We're talking about all for one here. He'll be ruthless. Mizu clutched his chest, squeaking in frustration. What is wrong with you, Stark? Why would you do that at a time like this? Aizawa narrowed his eyes. What are you doing here, Stark? What does it look like? This mission was my idea. I'll be damned if I miss it. Tony replied casually. Absolutely not. All Might interjected sternly. All for one is far too dangerous. I won't allow you anywhere near him. Tony smirked, lifting the mask of his suit to reveal it was empty inside. All Might, I'm literally in Europe in a penthouse, getting fed grapes by my girlfriend. I'm as far away from all for one as possible. From Tony's suit, Melissa's cheerful voice piped up. Hey, Uncle Might. Hey, Mr. Aizawa. Aizawa sighed, his tone flat. Hello, Miss Shield. All Might blinked in confusion. Melissa, Nizu, after recovering from the shock, squeaked again. Ah, I see. You're remotely controlling your suit from afar. Quite the genius move, Tony. Aizawa shook his head firmly. Even if you weren't involved, this mission is too important to let you participate. I won't risk its success just because you're part of it. Tony crossed his arms, his tone calm but determined. I get that you're worried about failing because this involves your friend and not a typical supervillain. But I've already proven my capability. 
You wouldn't even know what you do now if it weren't for me. It's because of my knowledge and skills that you're aware of the situation and planning this attack. And need I remind you, it's my tracker you're following. We appreciate everything you've done, Aizawa replied, his voice level but firm. But you're still a hero in training. In this mission, many lives will be at risk. Maybe not yours, Stark, but all of ours. Tony sighed, his suit ruffling the hair on the back of his head as he put a hand on his hip. All right, I see the subtle approach isn't going to cut it. He glanced around at the group, his expression serious. I'll be blunt then so we're clear. I don't trust any of you to get this done. I'm going to insert myself into this mission to make sure everything goes as it should. His bluntness left the room in stunned silence, his gaze sweeping over their shocked faces. Third person's POV. Eh? What do you? All might began, but was cut off as Nizu raised his small paw. Before anyone takes offense to his words, understand this. For people with high intellect, it's hard to trust others to do things exactly as they would. Tony didn't mean anything harmful. Even if his words were a bit blunt, Nizu explained calmly. As for inserting himself into this mission, I'm allowing it. With Tony's help, this operation will proceed much more efficiently, Nizu said, nodding toward Tony, who returned the gesture. Aizawa and All Might exchanged glances before Aizawa nodded. All right, if Principal Nizu gives his approval, I have nothing more to say. All Might sighed but nodded as well. I'm a little hurt that you don't trust us, but as long as you're not in danger, I'm okay with it too. Good. Now that that's settled, let's get back to planning, Nizu said, turning to face the room full of heroes, including Edshot, Best Genist, Kamui Woods, and Empty Lady. We don't know if All for One will be at this location, but we need to be prepared in case he shows up. I'll have the Iron Legion on standby, Tony added. If All for One appears, we can evacuate civilians safely. What's the Iron Legion? Edshot asked, raising a curious hand. Tony raised his palm, projecting a hologram of the Hosu incident, showing multiple suits of armor carrying civilians to safety. The heroes nodded in understanding as Nizu continued. All Might will be the first to engage. If All for One is there, the rest of you will be ready to ambush. Is everyone in agreement? With everyone nodding in unison, Nizu smirked, tapping his pointer stick against his paw. Excellent. Let's go. We have a villain to apprehend. In a Nomu facility, Teo worked rapidly, sparks flying as he meticulously adjusted something with a laser focus. The sudden flashing of red lights caught his attention. Lifting his welding mask, he rolled across the room to a wall of monitors. One button press revealed live footage of All Might descending from the skies, not far from the bar where Tamura and Kirojiri were. Teo quickly switched to another camera feed, revealing all for one, masked and calm. Sir, it's All Might. He's here. So there was a tracker. Good work, Teo, all for one said calmly. Do you need me on sight, sir? I could help, Teo asked, eager to prove his worth. You have your own mission, Teo. Focus on that, all for one replied as his screen fizzled into static. Teo sighed, leaning back in his chair. If you say so, in the bar, Kurojiri, all for one's voice resonated, calm yet authoritative. Kurojiri, looking much healthier after his treatment, turned to listen attentively. I need a favor, all for one said simply. Meanwhile, Tamura ignored them, engrossed in his video game, his hands free from the curse of his decay quirk, allowing him to finally enjoy gaming again. There was a sudden knock on the door. Pizza delivery, came a voice from outside. Kurojiri, did you order pizza? Tamura called out, annoyed. With no reply, he sighed, grumbling as he got up. Damn it, Kurojiri, you're going to make me pay, aren't you? He opened the door, but instead of a pizza, he found himself face to face with All Might, standing proudly with a broad smile. His fists rested heroically on his hips as he boomed. Fear not, for I am here. I've come to save you. Tamura froze, unable to process what he was seeing. All Might placed a hand on Tamura's shoulder, pulling him into an unexpected embrace. 
Forgive me, child, for not coming for you sooner. You won't suffer under that monster any longer. Tamura, momentarily stunned, thrashed violently trying to break free. Get your filthy hands off me. I've got you. You won't hurt you anymore. All Might said softly, holding Tamura even tighter. Tamura stomped angrily on All Might's foot. Let go of me, you disgusting hero. Tamura, duck, Kirojiri shouted from across the room. All Might, step back. Tony's voice came through urgently. In an instant, Tony flew in, pulling All Might back as a large red and gold nanite shield formed from his forearm. The door burst open, revealing a massive Nomu, its lipless mouth snarling as it wielded a glowing buster sword. The force of the Nomu's attack sent Tony skidding back until he slammed his shield into the ground to regain stability. Behind him, All Might shielded Tamura, holding him close. You have my thanks, young Stark, All Might exclaimed. Tony shot him an incredulous look. Save your thanks for later. What the hell were you thinking? A swarm of Nomus with cybernetic enhancements poured from the black mist that filled the doorway. From a nearby rooftop, Aizawa's voice crackled over the comms. Tony, it's time. Proceed with the evacuation. Tony didn't hesitate. Friday, initiate the backdoor protocol. The Iron Legion, already deployed around the area, began uncloaking. Tony's and Melissa's armor hovered above, watching over the scene like silent sentinels. A loud siren blared from the armors, resounding across the city. Attention, all civilians. Please evacuate the area immediately. This is a dangerous situation. Evacuate the area. The evacuation message echoed across TV screens, radios, phones, and billboards, while the Iron Legion suits began assisting civilians to safety. The battle had only just begun, but Tony and the heroes were ready. Tony released his shield, quickly shifting it into a sword as he flew toward the Nomu wielding the Buster Sword. With a swift swing of the Buster Sword, a burst of fire erupted from the blade, scorching the air. Tony expertly twisted his suit in midair, closing the distance with precision. In a blur of movement, he slashed through the Nomu's arm, severing it cleanly, before driving his blade into its chest, carving a deep gash that made the creature scream in agony. Without hesitation, Tony reverted his sword back into Nanites, which reformed into a smaller device. Leaping over the wounded Nomu, he fired the device directly onto its exposed brain. The Nomu convulsed violently as arcs of electricity crackled through its neural pathways. In seconds, the beast's body went limp, its tongue lolling out as it collapsed lifeless to the ground. As the fight continued, thick roots erupted from the ground, ensnaring the remaining Nomus. Kamui Woods was on the move, using his quirk to restrain the enemies. Empty Lady, towering above the battlefield, stomped down on several of the restrained Nomus, crushing them underfoot like mere insects. Meanwhile, Aizawa watched from above, his glowing red eyes locking onto the Nomus below. With his erasure quirk active, most of the creatures were left powerless, their abilities nullified, giving the heroes the upper hand in the battle. Third person's POV. Tony streaked through the battlefield, leaving the other Nomus to the care of the heroes behind him. His target was far more significant. Bursting through the doors of the bar, he spotted the ominous figure stepping out of a swirling portal. First came a normal leg, then slowly a man in a sleek, dark three-piece suit emerged, topped with a black helmet that obscured his entire face. The air grew heavier with his arrival. Well, if it isn't Anthony Stark, all for one spoke in a low, gravelly voice, laced with amusement. Tony raised an eyebrow, landing softly. That's my name. Looking for an autograph. All for one chuckled darkly. You're just as arrogant as they say, and you're as ugly as they described. Tony shot back with a casual shrug, hand resting on his hip. All for one let out a deep, rumbling laugh. A temporary problem, I assure you. Tony smirked. I wasn't talking about your appearance. All for one's laughter deepened, genuine amusement coloring his voice. Ha ha ha. Stark, you certainly know how to entertain. All for one then heard Melissa's voice through Tony's armor a bit further away. 
Tony, now's not the time to be bantering with the big bad supervillain. Sorry, love, Tony said, clearing his throat. He pointed dramatically at all for one. Stand down, evildoer. Prepare to face justice. All for one's hidden smirk was evident in his tone. And if I don't? Tony rolled his eyes, hovering up. Or nothing. I was just stalling for time. In an instant, All Might appeared behind Tony's Iron Man armor as he moved out of the way. His fist cocked back, the air thick with the force of his raw power. His usual beaming smile had faded into a grim frown. Detroit smash. All Might roared as his fist connected with All for One's helmet, shattering it into pieces. The sheer force of the punch obliterated the bar, sending debris and wind spiraling in every direction as All for One was sent flying off to the side. Black Mist was blown away, revealing Kuro Jairi, who was standing behind his master. Tony hovered in the air, smirking. Looks like it's time for round two, Kuro Jairi. Kuro Jairi straightened, his voice calm but strained. More like round three. You owe me for the jaw you broke last time. Fair enough, Tony quipped, as his arm cannon hummed to life, repulsor beams glowing bright. Before Kirojiri could react, Tony unleashed a barrage of repulsor blasts. Dark mist flared around Kirojiri, trying to absorb the blows. H -h 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 -h. A sonic blast cut through the air as present Mike arrived from the side, his voice splitting the mist with raw force. The repulsor beams hit Kirojiri dead center sending him crashing to the floor, rolling and skidding. Kirojiri groaned as he came to a stop, looking up to see present Mike staring at him with sorrowful eyes. Ow! Kirojiri muttered dryly, confused by the look of pity he was getting. Before he could recover, he felt his cork falter. His eyes darted to the side, spotting Aizawa glaring at him, red eyes glowing, hair standing on end. The same sorrowful look filled Aizawa's face, unsettling Kirojiri. What is wrong with you two? Why are you looking at me like that? Kirojiri snapped, irritation growing. Tony appeared before him, floating just above the ground, legs raised in a striking pose. Because you're just so pitiful. Without waiting for a reply, Tony slammed a kick into Kirojiri's face, sending him staggering back. The force should have sent Kuro Jairi tumbling, but he caught Tony's ankle midair and, with a growl, slammed him into the ground. Ugh! Tony grunted with exaggeration as the impact sent a shockwave through the floor. Then he chuckled. Heh! Just kidding! Boosters erupted from Tony's elbows as he used them to push himself off the ground, spinning in midair. Thrusters formed around his legs, and with a swift twist, he kicked Kirojiri across the face again. Kirojiri crashed to the ground once more, his body trembling as Aizawa blinked, allowing his quirk to return momentarily. He tried to activate his warp gate, but Tony was faster. A small device flew from Tony's gauntlet and attached itself to Kirojiri's back, sending electricity coursing through his body. Kirojiri convulsed violently. Tony twisted his forearm, increasing the voltage. Kirojiri's body arched as a scream tore from his throat. Tony, that's enough. Present Mike shouted, his voice sharp with authority. Tony hesitated for a split second as he never heard such a tone from Present Mike, then rolled his eyes and dialed down the voltage, allowing Kirojiri to collapse, gasping for air. With another flick of his wrist, Tony shot a second device at Kirojiri, nullifying his quirk completely. Kirojiri's consciousness faded as his body slumped to the ground. Aizawa stepped forward, his gaze hard but resigned as the black mist began to retreat, revealing the blue hair and tan skin of the man beneath. Present Mike dropped to his knees beside Kirojiri. No, Oboro. His hand trembling as he rested it on his friend's back. Why couldn't you have just been wrong? Present Mike whispered, his voice thick with emotion. He slammed his fist into the ground, his heart breaking at the sight of his once dear friend. Tony stood above them, his face impassive. Because then I wouldn't have been me, he replied sympathetically. Look, Tony said, placing a firm hand on present Mick's shoulder, his voice steady but reassuring, I promise you this. 
If Oboro's consciousness is still in there, I can bring it to the surface. And once I do, I can restore his body. He'll be back to his old self. Present Mike, usually full of energy, now look torn, his expression shifting between hope and doubt. Can you really do that? Aizawa asked, his voice low and filled with uncertainty. The idea seemed almost too good to be true, and his instincts told him to be wary. He didn't want to lose his friend again. Hasn't his body been through enough experimentation as it is? Present Mike finally said, his voice tight with concern. Tony raised an arm without hesitation, firing a precision blast that sent a Nomu flying before it could interrupt their conversation. He turned back to them calmly. Everyone gave up on trying to heal All Might. Remember? No one thought it was possible. I'm the one who fully healed him, brought him back to his prime. That alone should speak for my capabilities. He glanced at them with confidence in his eyes. If you're not sure, go talk to Nizu. He was there when I healed All Might. He can give you the assurances you need. Aizawa's gaze softened slightly, but the weight of the decision still lingered. We'll come to an agreement when the time comes. I just... Thank you, Tony. His voice carried a rare hint of vulnerability. Tony nodded, giving Aizawa's shoulder a reassuring squeeze. I'll leave Kurajiri to you then. I'll go check on All Might. He might need some backup. With that, Tony blasted off into the sky, leaving them to their thoughts. Meanwhile, All for One skidded across the cracked pavement after being violently thrown from the bar. His body tumbled before he caught himself, groaning as he sat up, spitting blood to the side. The last remnants of his helmet shattered, revealing his horrific visage. He slowly stood, his heavy breathing rasping through his damaged vocal cords. All Might's fist came flying at him again, but this time All for One caught it mid-air, his grip tightening around All Might's powerful hand. Cheap shot, All Might, All for One sneered, his voice dripping with contempt. I expected more from you. I'm honestly disappointed. All Might's expression twisted with anger, his eyes blazing with fury. What's truly cheap, he growled. His voice thick with rage, is using Master's grandson against me. With a roar, All Might unleashed his second fist, a punch so powerful it sent shockwaves through the air. The nearby windows shattered into a cascade of glass as the sheer force of the blow rippled outward. But once again, All for One caught it, his strength still enough to rival the symbol of peace. So you found out, huh? All for One chuckled, tightening his grip around All Might's knuckles. I suppose that arrogant little brat told you, didn't he? Stark starting to become quite the thorn in my side. I'll have to deal with him soon enough. His voice was sickeningly playful. Every word meant to provoke. All Might's eyes darkened further, his muscles tensing as he reared his head back. Without warning, he slammed his forehead into all for ones, the impact sending both men staggering backward. Blood began to drip from both of their foreheads, but where All Might's face was set in a deep scowl, all for one's grin only widened, showing his bloody teeth. You won't lay a finger on him. All Might shouted, his voice booming with unwavering determination. Oh, we'll see about that, Tashinori. All for one hissed, wiping the blood from his brow, his grin never fading. This battle may be nearing its end, but the war is just beginning. Third person's POV. With a burst of speed, All Might dashed toward All for One, delivering a powerful punch that caused the air to swirl around his fist from the sheer force of his strike. All for one raised his arm, catching All Might's punch in his massive hand. The impact created a powerful gust of wind, but AFO, with one of his many quirks, absorbed the shockwave into his body. His arm swelled grotesquely before transferring the energy to his other arm. With a sinister grin, he retaliated, throwing a punch back at All Might with double the strength. All Might barely managed to cross his arms in defense, but the force of the blow still sent him crashing into a nearby building, leaving a crater in its walls. Muscles bulging, All Might pushed off the rubble, rocketing toward AFO again. The ground beneath him shattered as he launched himself forward, eyes focused and full of determination. Gone was his usual smile, replaced with a look of grim resolve. AFO stood firm, 
preparing for the next attack as his arm morphed once more into a monstrous blend of muscle and machine. But All Might was faster this time. With a booming yell, he delivered a punch straight to AFO's midsection. The impact was catastrophic, sending shockwaves through the area, causing nearby buildings to tremble and windows to shatter. AFO grunted, absorbing the blow's force with another quirk, redirecting the energy into the ground beneath him to stabilize himself. Without hesitation, he swung his enlarged arm at All Might, the sheer force of his strike splitting the air. All Might narrowly dodged the attack, leaping into the air before coming down with an overhead punch. AFO caught All Might's fist with both hands, and the ground buckled beneath them from the immense power. He chuckled darkly, you've recovered, All Might, but your strength isn't what it used to be. Straining against AFO's grip, All Might growled, I may have weakened, but the strength I have now is enough. With a mighty roar, he landed on the ground, crouching low and pulling his fist back. Texas smash. AFO quickly conjured a shield using one of his quirks, but All Might's strength shattered the barrier, though it lessened the force of the blow. AFO slid back a few inches, visibly irritated. Suddenly, AFO raised his arm, and a hole appeared in his palm. From it, a massive spinning drill shot toward All Might. Before it could land, a device slid from All Might's leg, projecting a holographic shield that intercepted the attack. Both the shield and drill shattered, surprising them both. I gotta say, you might have a face only a mother could love, came a voice from above. Tony Stark, clad in his nanite armor, blasted into the battlefield, zipping past All Might and slamming into AFO with repulsor energy. AFO staggered back, momentarily caught off guard, but recovered swiftly. He grabbed Tony by the mask and slammed him into the ground with such force that the ground cracked. This isn't a fight for a child to intervene in, F.O. growled. Before Tony could respond with one of his usual quips, All Might appeared with a flying kick. Brazilian smash, he roared, catching A.F.O. by surprise and sending him crashing into a nearby building, which collapsed onto him. All Might turned to Tony, concern in his voice. Are you all right, young Stark? All Might heard a faint chewing sound before Tony, in the safety of his hotel room back in Europe, replied through the suit speakers, huh? Oh yeah, I'm fine. But you do realize this is just my armor, right? Ah, uh, right? All Might nodded awkwardly. But, do you really have to be eating right now? Melissa's feeding me grapes. Hard to say no to that, Tony said with a grin. It's one of life's many pleasures. You should try it sometimes. All Might was at a loss for words. So he turned his attention back to AFO who emerged from the rubble, brushing dust off his suit. You really think you two can stop me? Your combined efforts still aren't enough to challenge my power. Tony's AI Friday was already working on new attack strategies. Boss, he's absorbing kinetic energy and using it to enhance his strength beyond normal limits. All Might cracked his neck, ready for another round. Enough talk, let's finish this. He rushed forward the ground shaking with each step, his muscles surging with every ounce of strength he could muster. He threw another powerful punch aimed at AFO's head. AFO braced himself, but Tony's nanite armor darted in from the side, firing repulsor blasts at AFO's flank. Ever heard of a two-on-one fight? Tony quipped. AFO groaned as the combined attack pushed him back. Using another quirk, he hardened his body like steel, absorbing most of the damage, but Tony's continued assault began to crack his defenses. Persistent pests, AFO growled, releasing a shockwave that knocked both All Might and Tony's suit back. Tony quickly regained control mid-air, deploying drones to surround AFO. Let's see how he handles this, Tony muttered as the drones opened fire from all sides, pressing AFO even further back. All Might saw his opening and charged forward again. California smash. He bellowed, unleashing a devastating punch that caused the air to split and a blinding shockwave to erupt as it connected. AFO staggered, blood dripping from his mouth, but still he stood tall. He grabbed All Might's arm, his other arm morphing into a massive claw. Impressive, but still not enough. He swung his clawed arm down toward All Might. Before the blow could land, 
Tony's suit tackled All Might out of harm's way. Don't go down on me now, big guy. We're just getting started. All Might managed a weak smile. I like your spirit, young Stark. Let's finish this. Together. Tony paused, a realization hitting him. Together. That's it. All Might, fall back. What? But, trust me. Tony reassured him. All Might hesitated but nodded and leapt back, watching as Tony flew after him. I've got an idea, Tony said. Let's merge our strengths. All Might, let's combine. W what? All Might exclaimed in surprise as Tony's Nanite suit split open revealing the empty insides and began enveloping All Might's body. The Nanites fused with All Might's suit, the swam all over his body, from his chest to his arms and legs, enhancing every part of his body, and a glowing arc reactor formed at his chest glowing brightly. The suit's colors shifted to match All Might's signature design, with his golden hair tufts now armored. All Might stared at his armored figure in awe before smiling widely and laughing in amusement. Tony and All Might struck a flexing pose. Together, we are Iron Might, Tony's voice declared proudly. What's up, guys? Omni-sensei here. This is an important update. This series is unfortunately going on a hiatus. This part covered up to the latest chapter of the novel. I'll definitely upload the next part when there are more chapters. So, sit tight, subscribe to the channel if you haven't, and turn on notifications for when the next part drops. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.